Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are in the world. I am Tigris Osborne. I am the executive director of NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series. We are so excited today to have uh, the author and several contributors from the book, It's Always Been Ours. Um, we are gonna be talking about rewriting the story of black women's bodies. And I'm gonna let each of these, um, each of our guests introduce themselves to you in just a minute. Before we do that, uh, for those of you who are brand new to NAFA, thank you for being here with us. Uh, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance was founded in 1969 and since then has worked at changing perceptions of fat and ending size discrimination through education advocacy and support. You can find out more about us at naafa.org or follow us on your favorite social media at NAFA Official. Um, we are able to offer these kinds of events and this kind of programming th uh, free to our community through the generous support of people just like you. If you would like to contribute to that, there's a big old give button on our website where you can make a financial contribution. There's also information about volunteering with us available on our website. We'd love to have you participating. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge today our interpreters from Pro Bono ASL. Uh, they've been with us for many years now, and today we have David and Marbella interpreting for us. You can learn more about Pro Bono ASL and the very important accessibility work that they do at their website, which is probonoasl.com. Um, let's get into it. We have so much to talk about and so many amazing folks to talk about it with. Um, this time I'm going to invite each of our um, each of our guests to introduce themselves to you with just a brief introduction, and then we'll get into some dialogue about the book and wherever else the dialogue takes us about Black women. A thank you for being here um, at, at the beginning of what I call Black History Month Part 2, and other people call Women's History Month. Um, and this is also Eating Disorders Awareness Week, so we will get into some of those things. Let's start with an introduction from our author. Jessica, will you tell the folks about yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. I am the author of the book. I'm also a clinical dietitian, uh, specializing in eating disorders among marginalized folks. I have worked for academic institutions, but right now I work for Lion Martin Community Health Services, a collaborative care clinic in San Francisco per, uh, serving predominantly queer and trans folks. It's a very bias for us um, and BIPOC-centered clinic there. I am a black dietitian in the field, so one of three percent of the of the people in the field. I didn't know another black dietitian until 2020, um, and especially not an eating disorder dietitian till since then. So that has been an amazing um, development and evolution in my work, which led me to writing this book. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jessica. Chef, will you go next? Sure. Um, so I'm fresh or chef fresh. I use they, them and she, her pronouns, mix them up, any pronouns really. Um, and I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina, but where I live now is in Chicago. And that is where I do a lot of my work. Um, so I'm a farmer and a chef and um, I wear many hats in, in the community and in the world. And um one thing I like to share, besides that, I'm a Scorpio with a Leo rising and a Virgo moon, which is important, <laughs> is that um, my love language, one of my main love langu languages is acts of service, and I'm in love with my community. And so a lot of the work and how I navigate in the world looks like being of service to my community and um, reaching for pleasure and abundance and choice in all the work I do in the food work. I'm also a person with an eating disorder and a lot of intersections of being in a fat body. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Chef Fresh. Uh, Larry, can we hear from you next? There, hi, I'm Larry. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, all of them, honestly. Uh, now you said your thing. I want to say my thing, too, because I'm a Pisces. My birthday is tomorrow. I'll be 30. Um, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> um, I 
used to also be a teacher until the pandemic happened. I was a music educator. Uh, and then the pandemic happened and I realized that I stood too long and I didn't like it. So now I work as a production assistant at uh, Lucasfilm as well as the Peter Pan Foundation. So I'm still getting that education with children in. Um, I don't know what else to say. So that was all of mine. Thank you. That's a great start. We'll get to know you a little bit better as we go along. Um, Shana, will you go next, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Shana. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a social justice strategist. I'm also a former president of No Lose, which is an organization that promotes fat queer culture. Uh, I'm a writer. I write for Smart Bitches, Trashy Books, and I've also written for Autostraddle. And my pandemic story involved me kind of leaving my long-term nonprofit work to go back to grad school. So I'm a master of social work candidate and I'm studying narrative therapy. So that's very in line with our conversation today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And I think I saw earlier today, this is National Social Workers Month. Day. It is. It yeah. is. Yes. I saw Ludacris did a little like uh, video on TikTok about how I love social workers. So I felt like that was just for me. Thank you, Ludacris. <laughs> I didn't know Luda was out there giving shout outs like that. That is fantastic. Um, thank you, Shana. Eva Shana, will you introduce yourself, please? Peace, y'all. I'm Eva Shana. Um, I use they and them and he and him pronouns. Um, and I am a spiritual artist, a teacher, trainer, um, and coach. I live in North Carolina. I live in Durham and I'm from Texas. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's about it. That's me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. We are glad to have you here. We're glad to have all of you here. I'm really excited about this. Jessica and I have been talking about this since the book came out, but aligning everybody's schedules uh, around my NAFA travel and stuff was difficult. And so we feel so blessed that we finally got here. So let's get into it. Um, Jessica, let's start with a little bit. Well, first of all, will you tell the folks who may not know um, what the initials behind your name mean? And you talked a little bit about what it means to be you in your profession, but if there's anything more you want to say about that. Um, I would say something that overlaps in the book is my experiences just being one of the only Black people in a gazillion and a half spaces, especially the eating disorder space. So me talking about what my clients are facing, be it Black folks, be it fat folks, be it anybody who's not a thin white girl, um, is oftentimes disregarded. Uh, or I'm told that I actually don't see people with eating disorders because if they were, they'd be thin and white. Um, so that's the registered dietitian portion after my name. Um, yeah. And then of course, well, not of course, but that led me into Bay Area overlap with many of y'all including you, Tigris, uh, for the Health at Every Size community that I was finding there. And that lasted for a couple of years um, where, and I think Elaine I saw and Natalie uh, were there as I transitioned away from Health at Every Size because I found the focus on health to be very deeply embedded. And it just wasn't for me, for my friends, for my community, my clients, especially as somebody with a chronic illness. Um, and so from that we started forming spaces and deciding what, you know, I, we, everyone wanted to do differently in order to honor our own bodies and the medical industrial complex in society, but also in community. So I see that as far as the letters after my name. Thank you. And I'll just, for folks who are new to this, Health at Every Size is, um, uh, is a registered trademark of ASDA, which is the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. And hi, Angel. I see Angel Austin, who is um, in leadership at ASDA with us today. ASDA has recently been doing a lot of uh, rethinking that framework along some of the same lines as what Jessica just talked about. So I encourage you to check out ASDA and their work and learn more about this other fat black led organization <laughs> now, <laughs> not, not historically, like NAFA, not historically, but now, um, and learn more about that framework and see what you think of it. Um, Jessica, how did we get to the book? Reluctantly is the answer there. Um, in 2020, I started, I co-led the Amplify Melanated Voices like challenge on Instagram. And a lot of folks 
don't know that I started that and expected to lose uh, followers, Instagram followers. So it was geared very much toward the eating disorder community because that was my, you know, professional Instagram. So along with Alicia McCullough, uh, we were really like, mm, like what's the PG word for this YouTube? <laughs> what will be recorded? Uh, dismayed with how all of the white women in the field were talking about their own experiences, both with the pandemic and social justice. And it was just like, what is happening here? So we decided. Just, to- just so you know, Jessica, we don't require oh. that you keep it PG, especially when you were talking about justifiable anger at systemic challenges. So okay. you use the words that you need to use. Okay. The ones that come naturally, just put them out there. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes. So because people were looking for things to do in 2020, um, many people, especially after um, the, I'm like, what, how do I even say it in 2024, after George Floyd was murdered, um, decided to come along with us as we muted white folks on social media and started following Black folks. And with that came more attention for me because that landed across the world. And from that, I got an invitation to write this book from an editor at my publishing company. And I said, no. And she said, how about you think about it? And I said, I don't need to. Uh, She said, let's chat. And I said, I'm happy to say no to your face. So let's just have this conversation. Uh, Let's do it. And then I was hemming and hawing with Shayna, actually, and like the pros and cons list. It was like, I work with people one-on-one. If I could just reach 500 people with this book, I would be very happy with like that broader reach and not just doing that one-on-one work. So I said, yes. She told, my editor told me it would be the same as Instagram. It would just be those captions and like writing paragraphs from them. And she lied. Uh, so that was a year and a half or so, two years of writing and then writing the book. And in the book, uh, actually, Dr. Deb Burgard, a mutual of many of us, says that I exist in conversation and like that is how I do my work in community. And knowing that this book was going to be about Black people, I didn't think centering myself rather than community would be a good book. So I reached out to people and here we are. And here we are. Um, What is, so I know the numbers are, do not measure the whole impact, but you said you'd hope to reach 500 people. Do you have any sense of how many people the book has reached in the year that it's been out now? I've stopped asking because I don't want to be attached to them. When it hit, I think maybe 1,500 in the first little bit, I was like, that's enough. (laughs) Whatever happens after that, I am happy. I've reached my goal. And so I haven't, yeah, I'm trying not to be attached to to those numbers to gauge my success. (laughs) Um, Well, and and like I said, the measurement of the impact, it goes way, way beyond the numbers of the book sold. But y'all should get the book from your favorite local bookstore, your favorite independent bookseller. Um, You should also recommend the book to your library. This is a thing that I don't see us reminding each other to do very often, but I know my local library has a simple web form where you can recommend books to them. And they have, um, my library is a pretty woke library, believe it or not, for um, um, a smallish town in Arizona, but they get woker with the books I'm recommending because I just keep on putting books like this on their list. Um, so I encourage you to do the same. Um, Jessica, how did you end up? Why these folks? Why is this the collection of folks that um, that you asked to be in conversation with you for this book? The short answer is no lose in 2015. So I had not yet moved to back to California, but Shana and I were on the planning committee for the BIPOC day. And that turned into a very fun experience. And I was like, this Shana person, she's like a proper professional. She understands details and like has spreadsheets and Google Docs that she shared with us. And we like were supposed to re- like review that before we meet. I was like, I like her. She seems great. <laughs> and then at No Lose, uh, I met Fresh and we talked food and she was great. And I just wanted to hear all about the work they were doing. And even Sheena, I'd actually met earlier, I think at No Lose in 2014 or 2013 in Portland. Maybe not met, just like admired from afar. 
I think is what it was. <laughs> like a little crush in the background. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, but we were in Oakland at the time too. And we're doing a lot of community work there. And they've been like a huge part of my grounding on a regular basis. And Larry, uh, I'll let you tell the fun bits of how you got in with all of us. But I asked you because I was looking for, you were the young person that I asked about uh, when it came to Lizzo and her smoothie debacle. Um, And I was looking for, like, this is how the olds were thinking about things. I was like, how are the youngs, like, who are always on TikTok? Because that was a time when Lizzo was very on TikTok. How are the people who were interfacing, um, like, viewing Smoothie Gate? So that's how I reached out to you. Uh, since you brought up age and since none of us thought to say that in our introductions, um, uh, could I ask each of you um, just to real quick share what you uh, what you will about your age, your generation, your age number, like something that sort of places us in context. Um, so who the olds are, I, I don't I'm I'm 49 <laughs> over here coming in with the Gen X energy. Um, Jessica, what? how old are you? I'm 40. Too. So born in 81, so very much on that cusp. At times I'm like, I'm, you know, X. And at other times I'm like, ooh, I'm I'm an elder millennial. I'm just gonna own that, depending on what's happening. Eva Sheena. Yeah, same. 1982, you know, 90s kid. Um, and 41, I think. Yeah. Shayna. I'm 46, so I'm definitely an old. At least that's how I think of myself. I'm a zennial, so kind of right there on that cusp. Gen X and millennials. So fresh. And I'm an 80s baby too, so 82, so I'll be 42 this year. And Larry? I'm 29 until tomorrow. (laughs) Until tomorrow! New decade. Um, Thank you all for doing that. It just does give us a little bit of context. and, and uh, because I'm going to ask you about the narratives that exist about Black women and their bodies. Um, and I know some of those narratives are shaped by what we've heard from our grand elders, but their own narratives that they live through might be very different from ours. And at each generation, there are some differences in the narratives, but there are certainly some things that carry through. Um, And uh, let's go ahead and get some other voices involved in the conversation. Actually, Larry, since you were called out as the youngster, let's let's start with you. What do you think the existing narratives of Black women's bodies are um, and how do they apply to you? Um, I feel like the majority of times when people see me as like a fat person, I'm either Precious or Lizzo. So those are the places I live in between. And Precious has been a lot less since Lizzo has popped through. Um, especially because I am one of the TikTok people. I am definitely on TikTok. I'm definitely doing all the videos. I definitely post pictures. I definitely bought a Yiddy. I definitely took the pictures, put them on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And I kept tagging Lizzo until she saw me. So <laughs> I, yeah, I got, I was very busy the moment Yiddies came out. So I think that is the world, at least somewhat for the younger people. I also recognize that like, there's a lot more fat influencers online. I have like five or six different people that I follow for different ideas of like clothing things that I wear. There's even one for Disney specifically. Like it's, the landscape is growing, but it is still very much a, whoever is the loudest that people can yell out the most, that is the person you see. And that's the person that at least I think the youth are hearing. Um, And folks who are here with us live today, if you want to share some suggestions in the chat of your favorite fat influencers, especially fat black influencers, um, we would love to hear from you about who else you're following in addition to or besides Lizzo. Um, And hopefully now Larry. Larry, where can they follow you? On every social media that you can think of. I am Larry Mariola on every single one. I am that person. It is a problem. I am not going to work on it. It's a lot of fun. If you follow me right now, you'll see my Disney pictures the moment I walk into that park. Please enjoy. Thank you. 
<laughs> we'll be ready. We'll, we'll be ready. Um, other folks, what do you think about the, what were the existing narratives of Black women and femmes in when you were growing up or that you are living with now? Anybody want to jump in? I'll share some things. Um, I think growing up, especially folks in in um, fat bodies and flat fat black femme bodies, and growing up in the South, that piece which kind of intersects a little bit with how I identify of like this service person or caretaker, or like you know, even thinking about you know like a mama or auntie or you know I even recently was thinking about like as I identify with my arms like the flab these auntie arms or you know these things so I think about this body being kind of this this thought process of this caretaker growing up that was an association that I had at one point around flat fat flim black bodies as this nurturer or this caretaker and all of these different senses and not always in a positive light just like as a kind of a space of like your role, your you you that's what you do, um, and then also kind of also in the space of um, this this point of entertainment or attraction or like sexuality and all that stuff of the framing of flat black bodies is kind of a, a piece that I also associate it with, and so like I used to have a lot of challenges because like I was a fat person but I didn't have a booty like you know I always felt like my booty was too flat right and versus like if you're going to be fat you got to have be a fat person with a big booty or something like that so always this sexualizing or this kind of this body as a means of, of attraction and entertainment or sexuality or this like nurturer mama auntie grandma like I'm gonna take care of you and make you a pot of greens kind of thing and so those were some things growing up that I associated with like fat black bodies and my role in that. Thank you for those insights. Um, Ivashina, do you have thoughts about how this has, the narratives about black women's bodies have affected you? Yeah, I was thinking as I was listening to Fresh um, about my own relationship to the tropes of like mommy, auntie, you know, nurturer um, energy because I have wrestled with it uh, most of my life. I'm the eldest kid and um, <clears throat> was the oldest daughter. And so that was my role. Um, that is absolutely what how I was reared to take care of people. And it is something that I still um, identify with. And I also don't like to cook um, and uh, live on DoorDash. And that is complicated because both I'm a fat person living on DoorDash, right? Like there's, it's like you can't win, I feel like in a lot of ways as I try to feed myself. And then as somebody who is womanish, like I, I am a genderqueer woman, um, trying to find my um, womanhood inside of my masculinity has been really weird and, and challenging and interesting. And then sometimes it's really fun. Um, and so the 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 thing that I think about, I'm st I'm seeing definitely like black women's diversity. I'm seeing sisters with bald heads and, you know, who are um, uh, doing weightlifting. And, you know, I'm especially in the like kind of body movement, fatness, uh, fat fit like that crew of folks. I mean, I'm seeing dope. I follow a few like fat bodybuilders and body lift like uh, weightlifters. And it's, it's the, I feel like 20 year old me needed to see those folks because I, I'm learning that there is this way that I can, me personally can lean into masculinity that does not, uh, undercut the woman, uh, that I am, you know? And so it's, it's complicated for me, uh, this, this, this idea of the, the the narratives of black women's bodies, because I both identify with being a woman and I don't. Um, and I both lean into some of the, the tropes and I don't. Um, and some of the tropes feel affirming and, and I feel like it, it garners respect for people like my mama. 
who I call Mama Tina and, and other elders in her age group, you know, I say mama to them. And I, and I mean that with reverence and respect. I say sis to you, Tigress, and I mean that with a lot of reverence and respect. And um, none of those words to me mean you're supposed to take care of me. Right. Like if I if I respect you as an elder and I say mama, whatever, I don't mean my mama. I mean it in a very, you know, kind of black colloquial respect of an elder way. And I feel like the white gaze on that is also interesting to try to to wrestle with, because I, I feel like sometimes I have to be careful as I'm leaning into some things that are very colloquial and very cultural for me. And they, they garner respect and they actually have nothing to do with an expectation to make me a pot of greens. And right. Uh, so, yes, it's complicated. It's, it's very complicated. And I, I want to um, make sure we go back to what you mentioned about the sort of the titles that we use in our community with each other. Um, and I especially want to hear what y'all think about moving into auntie age and auntie recognition. Um, and um, but I want to also make sure that we just hear the sort of. Uh, first thoughts about Black women's, um, the narratives that exist already that we we hope to rewrite. Um, Shana, how have the existing narratives impacted you? Hmm. Well, I, I definitely felt some alignment with what I just heard. Uh, and I think something else I remember as a child was the strength, both the physical and emotional strength of the Black women around me, and this expectation that you would continue to be strong in the face of sometimes really horrific trauma and that part of that strength meant not talking about that past trauma or making it appear that you were unaffected by it um and sometimes that meant really great humor like I feel like the black women around me as a child were so funny like they could all have been comedians in another life um, but behind that was actually also a lot of emotional pain. So I think for me, part of rewriting that story as an adult is to really acknowledge emotional vulnerability and create space for that. Um, and to really reimagine what resilience looks like is not just physical survival, you know, but also healing at the same time. Yeah. Jessica, will you also... Um bring in that element of, like, I want to make sure we acknowledge that there is skin color privilege that impacts how we are seen as Black women, that, you know, the, those of us who are light-skinned have privilege that our dark-skinned sisters and siblings of all genders do not have. Um, and will you talk a little bit about where that fits into all of this? I'll speak personally, um, and then it may be globally. Uh, I was born in a suburb and raised in a suburb. And my mom was always like trying to get me closer to like the better schools, which always meant like the wider schools, like as we would go along and go along. So my mom is white, my dad is black. And my body was always like considered to be a giant body in the context of all these little white kids growing up. It was a problem in the doctor's office as you know, they were trying to find out why I was so big because nobody else was so big. Um, and with like literal poking and prodding, um, with like measuring my bones, like the length of my bones. Um, I remember, and we'll just be very frank here because of my precocious puberty. Like I looked at my medical record and they were really like, counting my armpit hairs at like whatever age it was. So like in this area that I grew up, like blackness, me, black gr girlhood was just like a problem, like to figure out. So that was a lot of my upbringing that brought me a lot of like to the work that I was doing with not white people. Um, but then a lot because my dad is black and a lot of like black womanhood was filtered through him. And that was super duper complicated because he had like been in the South, been in the church, seen how black men and, and particularly his dad were revered when they were abusing black women at home. And so how his framing about black women and black womanhood um, like came through in the way that he spoke about folks was not always positive. And I didn't have black women around me growing up. So it was more when I was coming into like adulthood and learning more and from getting more context for why that was happening um, was interesting. 
do you think like like Eva Sheena said we I, I wish young me had been able to see some of these images do you think if there had been more outlets or more media that was giving authentic representation of black women that that would have um helped you as somebody who was isolated from black feminine community of course if I had been watching Living Single instead of what what else was step by step. We're like, what was the white friends? Show? Friends is the one Friends. That we there we go. Friends. That's perfect. Uh I definitely I was re-watching Who's the Boss, which I still think is wonderful. Still, like, still super white. Um yes, if I had been watching or like anybody had introduced Living Single to me as a Yes, as a young person versus like the side black folks on Friends or Beverly Hills 90210. Oh, now here we go. Um, yeah, things would have been a lot different. Yeah. Um, let's talk about auntie <laughs> and and um, and mama and any of those other terms that we um that we use with black women in our lives. Um, how do you feel about people applying those terms to you? Eva Shana, you talked about how you apply them to other people. How do you feel about people applying them to you? I have relationships with people that are, you know, 24, 25 and, you know, getting ready to be 30. And so some of them are able to say umpty to me, you know, they're able to, to kind of mix uncle and aunt. And it's very sweet um, and, and incredibly affirming. And, um, and I like it. I like it a lot, especially if they're queer, um, especially if they're chubby um, or fat um, and or disabled or something like that. Like, yeah, I am absolutely your community auntie. Um, and I remember one time with my ex-wife, we were getting, we were getting ready to pull up to the to the house and this uh, group of young folks were blocking the driveway and um I got out of the car and I'm pretty short you know what I mean I'm five four these young people were all of six foot even it was about three of them but you know I, I got out the car like I was six six you feel me um and I was like I really had what the hell is going on all over my face and I didn't have to say a word and one of the young people got out of the car and said we finna move and I, I appreciate that's some auntie energy for me, that, that there's something about what he saw when I got out the car that he understood that I was going to stand on business or his head if he didn't get the hell out of my way. Right. And, and I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the respect and I appreciate being able to move like that. And there, it was unspoken. Um, I have no idea how he saw my energy, but I know what that that I was respected in that moment. And so I think it, it's complicated and I think it could be really beautiful. And I'll keep saying that it could be really beautiful when it comes from the, from a, an energy that I feel affirmed in and that I feel seen and that I feel respected. I like that I am 41 going on 42 and that I know what I know now. I'm happy in, in the ways that I'm aging. And I like that my big body or some people can bring them comfort when they look at me and they and they want to project that onto me. Um, I don't like certain expectations of what I'm supposed to do based on people's perception of my gender and my size. Like I just, especially when it's something that I just don't get down with. And so another s small anecdote is that I was standing outside of a protest here in Durham, outside of City Hall, and somebody recognized me from the club the night before. I, had, I went to a drag show the night before and that person was like, yo, was you at the pin hook? And I was like, yeah, I was. And I thought it was the hair. My hair is blue. So I'm like, clearly that's what it is, right? And this person said, you have mom energy. And I could have, you could have bought and sold me for a dollar in that moment. I, what? <laughs> at, the, at the bar you saw a mama? And this was a thin, white, young queer. And uh, yeah, I don't like that. Um, Saucy says in the chat, um, I'm somebody's auntie, not yours. I'm somebody's mama, not yours, right? And I have to correct people often, she says. And it sounds like that's what happened with that. Um, and uh, what did they find out from interacting with you in that moment? I mean, they tried to clean it up once they saw my face, you know, and and... Cause I, I give a lot of energy. I don't have to say a lot. 
So I definitely served like a what to, <laughs> you know, and they cleaned it up a little bit and tried to to compliment me. But it, it happens often, um, whether people say it or not. And again, it can feel good sometimes, but in that moment, that didn't feel good. Larry, I know that sometimes when you are younger, part of what people do is put some age on you as a fat Black woman because they want to put you in those mommy kind of auntie roles. Does that happen to you as a younger woman? Oh, constantly. I'm uh, about 5'8". I've always been tall. My dad is tall. My mom is tall. So at the age of two, I was supposedly looking over the pew at church. I don't remember a single moment where I wasn't treated differently at church or at school from any of my friends. And that was something that my friends could easily click on to of like, hey, sorry that happened, that we like were having fun and somehow you got in trouble that like authoritative people just couldn't click on to. It's, I guess, somehow gotten better as I've aged, but I'm not sure if that's just a people now know me and know what they should do near me or they'll suffer the wrath of my friends or if that's just the world is attempting to not be stupid I'm not really sure um but it definitely is I'm a theater person I like to perform I think I've played Motormouth Maybell every single time Hairspray has come along this is I'm not mad at it Motormouth is at the top when it comes to being one of the black characters but it's every mom. I am a mom character in any single show that might come up. Or I'm the, what, what is the case? The, the big bag lady who sets the show down. I'm the person who's supposed to belt. Amber Riley, if you've watched Glee, I'm Mercedes. Like there's a, there's a trope that you're supposed to fit in. And then when people find out like, I can't belt. It, I, I just don't know how. I don't growl when we're at church. I don't know how to do that either. I'm a very soft soprano. I can sing you through all the church songs, but I'm not I'm not that person. Mm-hmm. I feel like that throws them off for a second. But then it's also like, I'll fight you if that's the energy you're looking for. Like I I can collect that energy. I'm a Pisces. I feel what you're trying to give me. But I it, just like what Saucy said, it's not I'm not for you. It's that's not how it works. And for the people who it is for, they know what it is and they'll fight you too. That's just it. <laughs> One of the things that I find frustrating about having that sort of mother or auntie energy put on me by people who I don't know you like that yet. Like, it's not just that sort of respectful term. It is the whole energy and package that comes with it. Um, is that then I have to question all of these interactions about like, are you authentically interested in getting to know me? Or are you just looking for someone to take care of you in this way, right? Um, and I I find that, you know, that's dehumanizing, right? To, to have to examine every interaction to, to think about, um, you know, what if this is real? And what if this is you interacting with, um, as Eva Sheena has said many times, a trope, you know, a trope that you have. Um, Shana, what about you? Do you have, what are the tropes that you see show up and and enacted on you? Or how do you feel about any of this this language stuff? Um, You know, I definitely think that something that I've seen placed on me is uh, kind of being a bootylicious club girl because I do have a sizable juicy booty. And uh, I think that people like to place all sorts of personality traits on me because of that. You know, one, that I'm an amazing dancer, which I definitely am not. Um, As though I am like the video girl kind of come to life. Uh, Total strangers will come up and kind of comment on it uh, or smack my ass, particularly when I was younger. And uh, I feel like part of what has been amazing about getting older is the reduction of that. And when uh, cute black boys on the street started calling me ma'am and auntie, it, like I remember the first time it happened. I was in DC, walking down, wearing my pencil skirt, looking good. And he said, hey, hey, hey. And I thought, all right, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to fight over my booty. And he said, oh, ma'am, can you help me? And it just my heart melted. <laughs> So it really changed my relationship to 
talking to uh, black men on the street when I got old enough for them to kind of see me in more of this nurturer role, which is actually my natural personality uh, and what I wanted. Uh, and so that shift from sexualization, I think, was actually something that I experienced pretty positively because it was a shift for men. And they weren't people I was interested in dating anyway. Like I could see if I was dating more men, <laughs> that might have been more of a problem. But uh, it honestly just felt really good to me. But I have very little patience when non-Black people try to engage in that ontification with me um, or are fascinated with my butt. And I've had white gay men like come up, touch it, comment on my butt like you know interrupt my conversations to like say what they think about my butt and my cute little red dress and I know it's cute just stand over there and enjoy it you don't need to tell me what you think I was actually in Japan a few years ago and a bunch of guys were taking pictures of it uh so I'm sure there's pictures of my ass all over the internet uh it's very frustrating still, of course, for me. And, you know, I think that's really one of the narratives that I've been trying to, you know, reclaim for myself because there was a while when I didn't really like my body. And partly it was because of the attention that I got from other people when I was you know, kind of naturally a pretty shy person. Yeah, I, that hypersexualization piece is something that Angel brought up in the chat that, you know, the adultification of black girls and the hypersexualization of black women is a, like a huge part of what the existing narrative is. Also, side note, white gay men stop touching people's bodies. You don't get a pass to touch people's bodies just because you're gay. I hear this story over and over again, especially from people who have bigger body parts, whether it's the breast, the butt, the whatever, that there's a sense of entitlement there and it's coming a lot, particularly from that demographic group. Um please just stop. I mean everybody stop touching people without consent, but uh, y'all seem to think you have a pass for that and we gotta have you stop doing that right now um <laughs> chef i don't think we heard from you about the sort of how you feel about being called auntie or mama or any of those terms yeah it's it's super complicated like i you know i agree with a lot of what was said and it's hard because i really love i like love and embrace the kind of respect nature of it and like the embodiment of maybe that is associated with that as I age or as I gain wisdom. Um, but it's, it at times often doesn't allow me to be a whole ass human. And so like I know somebody in the comments were talking about like the way your fat is distributed, you know, and all of these different things. And so like, you know, that mama, auntie, that energy, I appreciate the ma'am and you know, all of that serves sometimes. And I appreciate that as a form of respect. But then I'm also like, what does that look like? And how does that embrace me also as a sexual being or trying to date or trying to navigate in this other space where people kind of get siloed in this like view of you? And like um, one of the things that I was thinking was kind of interesting is like you talk about like these different perspectives that people have. And so there's this one piece that is like, Oh, wisdom and age and like this kind of auntie role where there's like kind of more knowledge and more appreciation of of that. But then I also in my fat body has gotten this very much like not like having to prove my intelligence or having to prove, you know, you know, people's association with like, oh, fat, lazy, you know, dumb, like all of these different things people want to throw with it. And so it's like often the space of having to like flex or having to do something enough that people are respecting, you know, that you're an intelligent being and, and all of that. So it's just so hard because there's so many different angles of like, like to be a whole ass human, like I can be auntie role and be sexy and be in the club, right? And on the dating apps or whatever, right? And trying to get like all of that, um, it is hard because I feel like the more, as I age more and more, it's like auntie nurturer this, like I'm no longer like the dateable, the dateable fresh, you know, or, but yeah, that's, that's some of it. Yeah, it does sometimes feel like the space is either hypersexualized or no sexuality at all. Like, and that's it. There's no, you know, there's no in between for Black women. So you're either here to be 
um, you know, sexy for other people, not for yourself, for other people, um, or you are sexless and we and you are, you know, categorized as undesirable, even though we know that that is uh, not actually true. Um, so how do we rewrite some of these? We've talked about like, you know, some of the things that come up for us and what other people are projecting onto us, um, have projected onto us at various stages of our life. Where do we start with the rewriting, Jessica? Besides writing the book, um, where do we start with the the re reshaping this? I was at a book club for at maybe like 40 women yesterday, and I think only five of them were white women. And the part that in that whole conversation that I think at the what's an like less weird way to say the hook? I don't know what it is. Uh, but like the thing that their aha moment, I guess, was the respectability portion of it all. Um, and just the like, oh, wait, the things that we have been told aren't true. Like for whatever reason, that was the most like engaging portion in the like start to unravel. So like, oh, if I am performing for whiteness. Like, what are all these different ways that that is showing up in my life? And just the reflection that came from that was really palpable from that room. So in the rewriting, you know, I have always centered joy. I used to say joy, you know, was a tool. And Shana was like, no, you talk about joy as a weapon in all of this. So centering uh, joy, but also I think this book was a reflection of community and finding that in community, which is how I started, you know, doing this in 2015 and just seeing how when we have a shared set of values, how individually we can feel safe rewriting our own story. So community and joy, uh, Ifashina does a super great job of embodiment and just being able to witness that as rewriting has been beautiful and wonderful. Um, I would say, yeah, that some people do take out the journal <laughs> and literally re rewrite it. I think about it as a reflection of every day, like, am I performing for whiteness? Like, what am I doing um, type of situation and then undoing that. So not doing that anymore is part of my rewriting and then finding the love and community for me. What about the rest of you? What are some of the things that you are doing to rewrite this narrative for yourself or for greater audiences or for the um, the folks coming up behind you? I'll just say before I let you answer, I want to share. Um, I did some work last week with Bria Loren, who is a, a Black young black woman photographer in the Houston area. And we, you know, we spent the day together when she was shooting these photos of me and she talked about being auntie in her mid thirties, but also or early thirties, but also that she had been an auntie, but she never got to be an auntie baby. Right. And auntie baby being somebody who is like that person that the auntie is nurture. She had never gotten that energy. So that was part of why it was important to her to be an auntie. Uh, like whether you got that energy or not, like, do you feel a sense of like what you are giving, not just rewriting for yourself, but rewriting for what you are giving down to the auntie babies? Anybody have thoughts about that? Can I jump in really quickly? And I don't want to spend too much time here, but I met and have a friend, uh, a queer black friend who never had the auntie like energy in queer community. Um, and I was like, hey, Shana, I don't know what you're up to, but like this intergenerational situation, I think would be really beautiful um, in that way. And Shana was like, I guess I like people, but it was a, how can we like outside of heteronormativity, like think about this and being in that type of community and not having like the large age gap when it comes to auntie, but like, how can, you know, I be, you know, to somebody who is, you know, kind of my age, but just, you know, how can we have that together? Cause it looks different. Okay. Um, Shana, do you want to say more about how it felt to be sort of uh, tapped in in that way? Honestly, I don't remember this. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't. It was very subtle. <laughs> and I'm not going to name the person, but it was just, a, you know, yes, uh, we are older. Uh, this person has not had like queer auntie 
elders. Um, what does that look like in for us? Yeah. yeah. So it was natural, apparently, for Dana. You know, I do. So I'm a shy person, but who loves people. <laughs> So I do really love playing that kind of co-mentorship role. And I think that um, multi-generational mentorship is something that's been really important for me. You know, I have a lot of multi-generational friendships. I have friends who are, um, you know, in their 70s or 80s. I'm a fiber artist. I love to knit. So I have a lot of older, you know, knitter friends who... uh, who have been really inspirational and helpful for me and who I hope I also have shared some wisdom back. And then I have a lot of younger folks that I've been able to be in that co-mentorship with where we are sharing. So I think peer support has been a tool that's been really helpful for me where we're equals. It's not as though I have all of the wisdom in my forties, but there is so much that I have to learn as well. Uh, And I think For me, part of that is also the books that I read. So I really tried to cultivate reading other um, fat Black women. And there's a lot of uh, fat Black women who are writing romance and who are trying to reimagine what love stories look like for fat Black folks. And that's been really powerful and inspirational for me, certainly. Um, anyone else, I'm going to, I am going to also invite those of you who are here live to begin putting questions in the chat. If you have questions for the panel or for individual panelists, we have about another half an hour to go. So we still have time to get into some very, you know, very juicy things and I will keep taking y'all there. But if you have places you want to go, please let me know what those are. Um, Yeah, other thoughts on what you want to, how you are working on rewriting the narrative and how you, what you want to create for people coming up after you. Larry, you talked about the power of social media in that way for you. The sort of like um, putting yourself out there and showing yourself. Yeah, I'm just a goofy person. I don't know. (laughs) I just try, I don't know. I guess there's a a small part of me that's like, I, I think I stuck with still being an educator in certain parts like my social media as much as it is me just posting random pictures it's also me posting things that I'm doing with like the kids I work with in the Peter Pan Foundation most of them are wow actually a lot of them now are under 10 so they're also getting the same information unfortunately from social media so it is a lot of me going like you cannot call my sister and I auntie we don't know you like that but I do love you and I want you to remember that I'll take your role the next time you call me auntie. Like one of those kind of situations, um, which also our foundation, our director is really open to uh, hearing us. We tell her like, hey, you're going to want to put someone else in this role that you're trying to make the like one chubby kid who, yes, her voice does sound perfect for this. But I promise you, if you also hold the narrative that her school is most likely putting her in as well, it's going to mentally put her someplace that we don't want. And talking to those kids and also being like, hey, what character do you want to be? Do you want to be the lead? Do you want to be Belle and Beauty and the Beast and not Mrs. Potts? Per, let's do that instead. Because, yeah, Mrs. Potts' song is awesome, but you're also not, you don't need to be the mom. We can make another person the mom you can be the lead in your own show or in any show um i'm princess tiana for most of the kids because i like princess tiana and though princess tiana is thin i am still princess tiana and my friend moana is thick and asha is now thick and elsa is now thick and we keep taking all these characters and going guess what you can do the same thing do not put in your mind that you are just this one character you see. You don't have to just be Ursula. You can be Ursula because she's a bad bitch. And we enjoy being bad bitches. But you can be Ariel. And that is just what I try and do with the kids. But my social media is mostly me just being crazy. I think what you're saying about casting is really important. And I I hear an increasing amount of dialogue around casting. Um, You know, there are some some fat... um, 
theater projects that are talking a lot about the casting of fat people, but I have not heard them talk as much about the intersection of casting and of, of body size and race in casting. So I think that's really important. And I think what you're talking about also shows up a lot in the world of cosplay. I notice that people who want to express themselves as existing characters um, everybody else gets to do that no matter what they look like. But if you're a fat black woman, they tell you that character doesn't look like that. So you're not allowed to be that. And we like, we see a lot of trolling of fat black women cosplayers in that way. Um, Absolutely. I think that's really, um, I think that's really exciting that you are, you know, breaking those, breaking those barriers in casting it, that way. It's and a lot that, of fun. It's already hard when, especially if you're like a cosplayer on TikTok, if you're black, that is already a problem. That is the yeah. baseline problem because so-and-so character isn't black. They're also not white. The majority mm -hmm. of the characters you are going to cosplay are some kind of Asian. So sorry. That is the anime that you're watching and that is where it is set. It's in Japan. What are you looking at? But also when you then add the weight onto it, it's just like a, no, this person isn't fat okay, this person ain't even real. Like, what's the, I'm confused what the problem is. So it is very interesting to watch it on TikTok, but it's also a lot of fun. I follow, um, oh, I think her name is Midnight Pursuit. Uh, and she's a, a fat black cosplayer. And she just did like Miracle the Bunny Hero from My Hero Academia. And that character is dark skin. I don't know if she's supposed to be black, but I've decided she is black and that's just how it is. Um, and she's very fit. She's like a bunny. She's super buff and everything. And one person wrote in her comments like, oh, really, that's what we're going for. And we all tore them apart. We absolutely tore them apart. Because why are you coming here for that? No one is looking for you. We wanted her to do Mirko. We knew it was coming. You're ruining our art. Go away. And you just have to tell people to go away. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there should be more of telling people to go away. Um, Chef, what about you? Are you? I don't. I don't want to pigeonhole you as a farmer and, um, you know, and and somebody who cooks for folks. But like, is there a way that you're using that work to rewrite the narratives about Black women? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like a few things. One is like, you know, I am so happy, Larry, that you're doing social media. That is one thing that I want to be better at and not be <laughs> so exhausted in order to do and share because I think there is something especially as a like super fat womanish queer person that like that visibility into like the life and the work and the things that I'm up to I would love to share and so trying to figure out like what that looks like in, in that avenue but you know I think navigating especially doing food systems work and access work and farming and chefing and, and especially at the way that I do it at the point of like trying to make things accessible for folks and meet people's dietary restrictions or anything that they have. It's often a space that also is at the intersection of people attacking fat folks or people writing grants as to why we need to grow more things in the city or have people come to gardens because of fatness, right? Like that is the enemy there. And so I feel like for me doing that work unapologetically as a fat person, like is kind of me trying to like combat that too. And me trying to show like, we can also, farmers can look like this. Chefs can look like this. We can do community work like this. We can feed ourselves all of these things. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that is kind of this way I navigate and do it and make sure like how our language is at our farm and, how we're cooking and feeding people is accessible um, and not alienating. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I'm trying to be up to and I've been getting pushed for a long time is also to write something. And so, you know, I'm looking to write a book. I'm looking to like do a lot of this work to kind of also highlight folks and and have the way that I'm cooking and the way that I'm farming and, and interacting with food captured, you know, I've been really impacted lately around like, okay, I have to tell my story. No one else is going to tell my story. There's like, there's some archive, there's something that I have to leave around like the work that I've done here and the work that I've done with community and what folks have been up to. So yeah, I think that that is something that feels important to me right now and how we, how I navigate this work I'm doing as a fat person 
and, and normalizing that feels super important. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Eva Sheena, I just want to go back to what Jessica said earlier about you being a leader in talking to people about embodiment. Will you talk to us a little bit about that concept of embodiment and how what it, what it for you has to do with re- rewriting these narratives? Yeah, I when I very first started doing embodiment work, it was before we were talking about somatics and the nervous system to the degree that we are kind of publicly, right? Um, I was in my 20s and I had come to understand that I kind of wore my body like uh, like I had this shirt. It was kind of not a part of me. It was just a body. I was just kind of in it. And I wasn't really present inside of my body. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, again, I, I think I said this at the top when I was talking about who I am. I'm a spiritual teacher and an artist and coach. And so this is looking at embodiment is something I've been doing for years. Um, and. I didn't know I I didn't study somatics, right? Like I did I studied um my grandmother and I studied my mother and I studied um uh, dance, right? I, I've been uh, taking dance classes and dancing and performing since I was eight years old. And so those are the things that I've channeled to help me be um inside of my own body. And as I I'm, I'm always going to be someone who teaches and does my work from lived experience, not because I think that what fits for me should fit for other people, but because I think we discount lived experience as a form of uh, expertise. Um, and I think that things are not one size fit all. So what makes me feel in my body, what makes me feel embodied is very different than what does that for fresh or even for Larry, I, I see the way that both Larry and Fresh are talking as embodiment practices, right? To be with the earth and to, to farm and to, to think about food and the way that it uh, both connects you and community. Th- that is, you got to be in your own body and you have to be able to be with other bodies to do that work. When you're taking on a character, I've been in plays with, with Larry, actually. And so when you're taking on characters and, and engaging another person in that way, you got to you are now embodying some concept of some character and y'all are doing that together. Uh, so for me, uh, the way the way that I kind of see the way all of us are kind of talking, all of that is embodiment um, because it it is about not only being in your body, but being with other bodies um, and being with concepts and things that um, help you be able to be with your body. And so yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I, I want to say about that. And I, I think um, as far as the the whole narrative, like, I, I guess the thing I'll say in this moment is I, I put this in the chat. My wisdom and my intellect is one of the last things that people see. It's one of the last things that people want to engage with. I'm a very deep, very introspective, very... Um, somebody on a journey trying to do the best that I can. And I like to talk about it. I like to talk about it out loud. I like to give examples out loud. Um, I am a ministerial person, a priest even. And so what I often have to do is, is, is insert that in a room with someone. Most people don't expect their priest or their healer or their wellness worker or whatever, all kind of labels and stuff that I, to look like me both physically, the body that I'm in, but also my energy, how I get down, the way that I talk, the way that I speak. Um, I run the risk of embarrassing a certain uh, sect of Black people because I do not code switch. I don't change my vibe. Um, and, you know, the respectability thing uh, is it's a thing. And it's a thing as a Black person, but it's also a thing as a fat person. I'm not supposed to show my stomach. I'm not supposed to, you know, eat a bunch of food in a particular way in public. I'm not supposed to talk about the fact that I ain't trying to lose weight. I sure ain't. I don't have a scale. Like, you know, and so there's a, there's how do I, Ifashina, represent something higher than us, uh, like spirit or or community or uh, uh, God even, right? Or even a non-God concept, but, it, but again, uh, philosophy you know, things that are very serious, um, that I feel like that for me is a lot of the switch in the narrative that I do is, is to purposely be all those things in a room. I don't care what room it is um, and challenge people to combat whatever they're dealing with when they look at me and, and having to engage. I'm moving you and making you feel and think about things that you 
probably don't usually think about and damn sure wouldn't take from me. Um, and I, I just keep doing it on purpose, intentionally. And beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have a question from MJ. Um, that question is, how do you peacefully combat people who label you aggressive in professional spaces? The expectation for me to tolerate disrespect due to the shape of my body is goofy. Goofy. But how do you navigate that, especially when it is in your workplace and you need your job? How, how do you what do you do with that energy? It's not peaceful. For one, I just got my job. I think the main reason I got my job was because the higher white people who were in the interview were like, oh, she'll keep her head down, possibly. But if we need someone to come in and be that person, she'll come in and be that person. And my manager fully stepped me aside and was like, so what's your vibe? Like, who are you actually? And she's a white, small woman and was like, I just want to make sure I come right with you. We're going to be working together all the time. I don't want us to have any kind of weird vibe. I don't want to say anything. I want you to like educate me on how I'm supposed to support you in that way. And I was like, thank you. Cause I, I will explain if they act up a fool. Like, I understand I'm young, especially at Lucasfilm. A lot of the people who are still there are the people who were there when they did the first Star Wars movie. I also know nothing about Star Wars. So that was also a thing that they were like, you don't know about our stuff. No, it's old. I know about Black Panther and I came to work for you because I really want to meet Mark Ruffalo because I like the Hulk. Thank you. Like, leave me alone. But we have moments when people will be like, oh, this thing, like we... Someone came at us and we don't really know what we should say. And da 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 da. Can you help us with the thing? And it's like, I, it's not my problem. One, that is actually not in my, uh, in my paycheck. That's not what you pay me for. So I do apologize, but I won't be doing that. But two, ain't you grown? You don't know how to do that. Like I thought I you. Why are you not? Why do you not understand what your job is? Because my job is simply to help my friend. That's a little weird. And I just keep that energy. Nine out of 10, I will become a gen uh, alpha, I think they are. I'll fully move younger and act a fool. I have three degrees. You, you will not bother me at this job. And I get a free card from you to go to Mickey Mouse. And I'm going to Mickey Mouse. So I'm not going to quit. So we just got to figure this out. And I've already figured out what I'm doing. So, mm. and I just keep that energy. That is the entire energy, Monday through Friday. 8 to 6 p.m., even at lunch, especially at lunch, because I'm going down to comments and ordering a burger and fries and do not talk to me while I'm doing it. Thank you. I think I aspire to be Larry in my life. Uh, I will second Larry again with the it's not peaceful. I think the way that I have gotten through um, corporate life is because I don't lie <laughs> um, is how I like to think about it. I am always telling the truth about what is happening in a space. Like this is the dynamic that is happening here. Supervisor, do you see that? And then, you know, what are, what are they gonna say? No, I don't see it. I mean, and if they say, I will point it out. Like this is the pie chart. This is the Venn diagram. This is what's happening. What do you think about it? Because I'm not doing anything about it. So I find that when people can't argue with me, um, that I, it's not mine anymore. You, you could handle that. I similar to Larry, like, this is your job. <laughs> this is not mine. Uh, this is your job to handle because you are the supervisor and you signed up for this. I have not. It's how I'll do with it on paper. Yeah, I would just add to that as someone who has seen Jessica do that masterfully when we worked at the same organization that uh, I used to spend earlier on in my career a lot of energy and defining ways to make myself small at work and non-threatening to counteract the physical large presence of me as though I could make the rest of me feel small and then I would seem less scary. And it really took a pretty dramatic work transformation, which actually Jessica talks about in her book, to realize that it did not matter what I did. It didn't matter how peacefully or kind 
or loving I was when I tried to share just in the gentlest possible way some home truths, people would see you as aggressive because you were a Black woman and that's just it. It just doesn't matter. So when I had that realization for myself and let go of that expectation, so if the conversation didn't go the way that I'd wanted, they were not able to hear me, that wasn't because of anything I did. And, you know, for MJ who asked this question, it is never because of anything that you did. And so letting go of that expectation and recognizing that people will see you how they're going to see you, you cannot control that. It was so healing for me and it really enabled me to lean into being authentically and honestly myself. And then it just didn't matter whether it was going to be aggressive. And strangely, actually, I get that less, right? I get that far less from people now that I am speaking my truth and immediately naming if somebody has crossed a boundary, especially if it's you know, a disrespectful boundary, like that means that I'm respecting the relationship that I have with them enough and I respect myself enough to actually state what is going on. And I, I find that if anything, I don't get as many aggressive comments, but really if I did, that would be okay too. So I just want to encourage you to like reframe those interactions. And it can be so easy when we're having a negative interaction to just look at the kind of small picture, which is you with that person. And if you can widen out the frame and look at the broader systems of oppression to have brought you to that moment, then I think it also lets you let go of any feelings of guilt or responsibility that you can control the reaction from someone else. Um, we have one more question from the chat and then we'll go to our closing question after this because we unfortunately are getting closer to that time. Um, this question comes from Angel who asks, how can we bring more fat Black folks who exist at the largest end of the fatness spectrum into more mainstream conversations about our bodies? Um, Angel says, in my work, I find that so many of us I mean, those of us at the largest end are disassociated and in so much physical, emotional, and mental anguish that people in bodies that are different than ours just do not experience. So how can we bring more of those super fat and infinite fat voices into these kinds of dialogues? Any thoughts on that? Fresh, were you finna say something? I, I mean... One of the things I want to say is that I am super fat and uh, I'm 400 pounds. And, you know, what I think people sometimes project onto me is my agility. Um, right. Like, that, you know, I'm dancing, I'm teaching dance and I'm teaching movement and people, you know, it's almost like they forget that I'm 400 pounds and I am. Um, and so everything from the, the pain that I hear Angel talking about to um, having to. Uh, tell people, I, I actually make requests sometimes when I'm going into spaces to teach for load-bearing chairs with no arms, right? Like I, I will say that when people ask for my access needs. Um, I think uh, we have to amplify the the language that you use, Angel. We have to say, it, you know, super fat, infinity fat. We have to say and talk about the the not only the pain and the anguish but the systemic reasons for it that if i go into a room and none of the chairs in here fit me then you know did you really want me in this conversation did you really want me in this space you know and i'm not gonna let you lie to me and say you did because you clearly didn't you didn't think to you know bring in the chairs that would fit me um i just taught a, a dance class and really a wellness space for a group here in durham and when I was doing the prep conversation, I got online and showed him where to get load bearing chairs that hold a thousand pounds. And I was saying, look, if you're going to have a movement space, you got to have these kinds of chairs. And when I showed up on that Friday, there were 10 of them in the space. I think that people that you're collaborating with have to show up like that, too. So we can bring our voices, but then we also have to you know, be in conversations with people that say they want to collaborate with us and they really have to show up um, in these ways. Thank you, Eva Sheena. Anybody, Chef, did you want to add something to that? No, I think what they said really, um, really got at it. And I think the other thing is, I mean, for me, it's just fine to ask, 
You know, like if, if there's folks who voices you want to hear and you want them to be a part of conversations, I think, you know, starting by asking, you know, what would it take for you to participate? What can I do? And, and you know, maybe it's a meeting where folks are at. Um, if you're doing digital stuff, like what people schedule. I think it's, it's to me, it's like any type of inclusion work around like getting voices that you want heard is like, how do you meet them where they're at? How do you make spaces accessible? How do you, you know, um, include them in conversations? And how do you like, especially in spaces where there's valued opinions and voices and perspectives, like is there compensation? Is there a means for compensation? Is there something, you know, like how can you bring folks in? Um, and I don't know it, particularly what type of work, but if, if you're writing, how do you get folks covered in, in media or articles or, you know, if it's spaces where you can bring people in and having chairs and seating or accommodating people's time requests or, you know, to me, it's just like that piece of asking, but definitely everything that Aoife Sheena said. I'm going to plug real quick for Aoife Sheena's social media. Um, I have used that as a resource many times for my fat clients and Again, just seeing people, Larry's already mentioned, like in regular everyday life, rather than trying to be some inspirational being has been like very uncomfortable and beautiful for a lot of my clients. So again, I'll just plug that. Yeah, and I'm going to have each of you give a final thought in a second. You can also share where people can find you online. Uh, before I do that, I will just remind everybody that all of our virtual events, almost all of our virtual events, other than our Fat Affinity Space, Fat Fridays Virtual Social Club, all of our other virtual events um, end up on our YouTube channel at NAF Official. So you can see Angel with a couple of other folks from last Fat Liberation Month talking about supersized perspectives by looking up that video on our YouTube channel. You can see other Black Black women and femmes talking about their experience, their lived experience in their bodies or their research about, um, you know, about the experiences and the projections and the stories of Black women. Everyone from Dr. Sabrina Strings, um, you know, who is a thin Black woman who, but who writes about anti-fatness to Dr. Joy Cox. Um, we've interviewed Dr. E.K. Dauphin, who is as someone who is, in her words, a little spicier, so a different generation voice, giving us some perspectives on fat Black life and um, you can find her book on fat and faith at your favorite, you know, bookseller. So like they, there are lots and lots of voices besides the six of us that have been here with you for these 90 minutes. Um, so please take a look at those things. Uh, let's just do sort of a, a round and just a final thought from each of you and then remind folks where they can find you to follow you and learn more about your work. Um, Eva Shana, will you start? Yeah, you can find me. Um at a couple of places online, get.embodied on Instagram, um, as well as queering gender, queering.gender on Instagram. Um, and then my website is getembodiedsoulmovement.com. And any final thought from you? Um, I appreciate uh, conversations about gender um, that allow us to think um, with a lot of nuance. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to be in this conversation uh, with you all because we went to a bunch of different places. Um, I think that, you know, my, my fat body and my fat life um, is really complex and beautiful. Um, and I, I appreciate any opportunity to share about the nuances, not only of, of my existence, but the existence of the people that I'm in community with. Tigress and Fresh and Shana, very specifically, are uh, people that brought me into fat liberation. Um, and so um, I just want to thank the three of you for being trailblazers. Um, but I also want to thank everybody here in this conversation for um, having a nuanced and in a complex and dynamic conversation about Black uh, women and Black uh, womanish people, right, in this way. It's really beautiful and it's affirming and, and incredibly humanizing. Thank you. Larry, I see you next on my, my grid, so I'm gonna ask you next. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, 
I wanted to tell a small story. So I was going to say it earlier and I forgot. <laughs> so um, previous to my time at Mills, I don't think I actually thought much about my body outside of like whatever was said to me by friends and family members. Um, and it definitely was more on the negative side. And that was until I met Ifathina and some people um, when they came to Mills for, uh, I think it was like a when body positivity isn't enough. And I was, I think I was a sophomore. I have no idea what year that was anymore. Um, but that was an event that like someone else had put it on. I was in their group. That was like our Fed at Mills group. And I was like, I won't be able to make it. I have a class, but I'll, I'll come here to set up and I'll come to like take down the chairs and everything afterwards. And I met Yusina and Yusina was flirting with me. I'm going to call you out. It was good. I liked it. I didn't know. That was the fun part. I had never been flirted with before like that. Like someone else had, I think Vanessa had to point it out to me or you also pointed it out to me. It's like, you're flirting with you. I was like, you are what? I, you are? That's crazy. People flirt with me. That was like a, I had never, it was great. I loved it. But that was how I got into these conversations, right? I immediately attached myself to Christina and Vanessa and uh, Rahway. Like I, I got into the Black Rage, Black Magic. I went to one of your getting body classes. Like that, I feel like is the best way, especially for my generation. We will stay behind this camera if it's the last thing we do, because this is a safe space. And sometimes it's the only space we know. But if you find that one person that might flirt with you and you go, I've been flirted with, you, <laughs> you just attach and you hope for all of the uh, all of the world that you can continue attaching on. And it's been really nice to attach on and talk with people and go to places. So thank you so much for that. Larry, tell people where to find you so they can attach on to you. Oh, um, I'm Larry Mariola on Instagram. I'm on there the most on TikTok. I'm coming back on there the most. Don't look at everything from 2020. It was a weird time. On Facebook, I am my government name, Leyland Patterson Parms Ford. Have fun finding that. Um, yeah, every other social media though, Larry Mariola. Thank you, Chef Fresh. Thank you. Um, I think um, all the social medias, which I'm not as active on, but I'm working on it, are at Chef Fresh 82 um, and then or um, at Fresher Together. And then websites are ChefFreshRoberson.com and FresherTogether.com. And um, I think all I want to say is thank you so much for including me in this this conversation. And I appreciate spaces where we can just come as our full selves and and share like so many different parts of us and and just be with whoever we are and also share from the not fully baked ideas and like you know all of the different spaces that you know just having a conversation so it's great to kind of be in this space and to hear you know different perspectives and things that are going on and what folks are up to and yeah i'm just i'm happy to be be talking with y'all and and you know i enjoy all of you i mean, it's so good to meet you larry i can't wait to follow you on social media <laughs> um, but for so long it's just been great to navigate and have you know y'all in my life in in different ways so thanks for having me here thank you for being here shana Yes, I would just also say thank you for having me and for the wisdom that everybody shared. I really love and appreciate all of you. And I'm so grateful to meet you, Larry. I cannot wait to see your Disney trip. That makes me so excited. So maybe you better post all the pictures because know that I will be watching and liking every single one. And I'm not great at social media, but you can find me at Black Bay Breeds on Instagram, where I'm trying to keep up with what I'm reading for folks, even though I'm busy writing my pieces right now. Thanks. Thank you. And Jessica. I'll plug again Shana's uh, romance reading, but also reviewing and how great that has been for a lot of people, too. Final thoughts, something that we didn't get to um, was Black folks and health and healthism and stuff. So if folks are 
I'm like, that's broad. <laughs> Go look at it. Don't like, that's not helpful. Um, if there are opportunities in your life to have conversations about how blackness is inherently pathologized and problematized, I would encourage that too. And recognizing that you are not inherently unhealthy, like your body is not a risk factor. Um, and that your body's not a problem. It's not a project. And yes, where again to find joy and community is where I would leave that. Thank you, Jessica. And I want to remind y'all Jessica's book, um, which is a community book, uh, is It's Always Been Ours, Rewriting the Story of Black Women's Bodies. Um, these panelists are all in here. And I want to thank Jessica for expanding this invitation to the panelists, because when, you know, I'm going to talk to a book author, I think I'm going to talk to that author. And it was Jessica who said, um, I'm not a fat Black woman and y'all are a fat space and we should have the fat people who were in my book. Um, and let's do this all together. That's that's how you ally thin people. That's how you really do it. Um, and so, Jessica, I want to thank you for that. I, of course, want to thank our interpreters today, David and Marbella from Pro Bono ASL. Um, if you've got it like that, please give them some support in addition to giving us some support. Um, you can give to NAFA at NAFA.org slash give. That is how you keep us being able to compensate folks like this for their time and, um, and to do all the administrative things that it takes to bring these kind of programs to you and all the other important work that we are doing, including the Campaign for Size Freedom, which seeks to make it illegal to discriminate based on body size. So please do check us out more, learn more about that. And, um, and we hope to see you next time on the NAFA webinar series. Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on socials to find out when the next one is. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care.